Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here tonight. And we got an interesting show. We're going to discuss two court cases that you will not hear about in the press. And they are interesting. They sh you should want to know about them. And also, um, we're going to, because these are people that have been falsely accused, and then the whole process has torn their life apart. Uh, and they don't, it was very difficult. And here's the main thing. The accusers know that it's false. And the state knows that it's false, and they keep coming after them. So that's part of the discussion. But there was two court hearings, one Wednesday, one Friday for each of them. And uh, we're going to discuss what happened in those court cases. Before we get into that, um, we talked about Patterns of Evidence, a movie about the Exodus and the scientific, historical, and uh, archaeological record uh, around the Exodus of the Israelites leaving uh, Egypt under the reign of Pharaoh. And the movie, uh, which was last week, uh, it Basically, the, the theaters, the 650 theaters that it was shown in, were very pleased with the attendance. So th for another 500 uh, theaters, they did in a replay. Tonight started at 7, so still watch the show. You can't go to the movie. But it, the comments on that were overwhelmingly un unbelievable. The people that I know that went to the movie, their comments were, this is fantastic information, and that I can't believe the denial of certain political groups that the evidence is sitting there right in front of them, and they just say, no, that does not exist. You know, that type of thing. That, you know, uh, there was no Israel army in Egypt, and they show all the evidence, and we'll just ignore it. So anyway, that patterns of evidence, when it comes out on DVD, which, you know, let's go by history of most movies. It's usually out uh, three, three, four months after the uh, movie comes out uh, at the theaters. Uh, so the other things we're going to talk about tonight is Maplewood, uh, my talk, visitor's presentation at Maplewood, it gets into two subjects, Class B city, domestic violence, and then also there was a town hall meeting, um, and we're going to show some clips of that with Senator Weger and State Representative uh, Peter Fisher up in Matamidi City Hall, and I'm going to show you some of the uh, things that were presented and then uh, give a little input back and forth, and then we'll get into these court cases. So we got a lot to discuss tonight and um, we'll, we'll go from we'll go from there so look I, I want to talk about Maplewood here but uh, before we do that um, I was trying because I did my visitors presentation I was trying to find it and I went through the links on the Maplewood website for the city council meetings and if you go through, and are we hooked up on this to, to go over there? I, I don't do it right now uh, because I don't have the right thing up. Uh, it looks like I deleted the, <laughs> the one I need to have up. But you can go to the Maplewood website, um, and we're going to see it real here, Maplewood City Council. And, you know, just Google Maplewood City Council and... There, okay, now you can put it up on the web screen, uh, web, or on the TV. Put it up there. <clears throat> okay, that's, we got some new equipment and getting the right numbers to go the right place. There we go. Okay, so that's the main website here, and this goes down through um, the workshop agenda this is for last week or this week 
uh, and then the meeting agenda uh, packet. And then on the page, they have a spot where you can click here for watch city council meetings online. It's over here to the right where I'm moving there. So you click on that, as I did. Sorry, clicked wrong, clicked it up. And then what comes up is where you can go and there's the Maplewood and you can watch the meetings. But I noticed February 24, 2014 was up there. See, I, I should automatically be able to go to the most recent one, but here's, here's a spot for the archives. So I click on archives to go get the meeting and the last one they have, you know, we start from January 2010 and it goes uh, all the way up to February 24, 2014. That is all that is there. So you're thinking, where, where's the meeting? You know, I can't, why, why isn't it updated there? And, and for some reason, I got to think, you know, wait, wait a second, there's more than just the city council. So are all the meetings not up to date? Have they not been put online for the last year? I don't know, but I thought I'd check it out. And so I went back to the main page and then it says view all. So I clicked view all and I thought, well, the Human Rights Commission, they got to be there. So I clicked on Human Rights Commission and then watch meetings online and there's archive meetings. So already we got a few extra steps going on here, but not at the city council level. Looked at archive Maplewood meetings. And there it is, City Council. Well, I don't know if that's the meetings, but I went to Human Rights first and found out, okay, these are archived, they're up to date. So I went to City Council meeting and there's uh, January 26, 2015 and clicked on that. There was the video. Uh, they're, they're not up to date on this, but it's been over a year that this has been going on. And if people have been able to find this the other way, like I eventually did, they're not going to complain about it or whatever, but this needs to be fixed. Well, I finally find it, so now I can play you a clip of uh, uh, last week's, uh, or this last Monday of what I said, but there's two issues here. One is a Class B city. So I'm going to comment on that first, and then we're going to, we're going to play that so you have an understanding about my comment. And then we're going to talk about domestic violence and also entails into some of the court cases that I saw today. But Maplewood is a Class B city and they had somebody from the League of Minnesotas come in and explain the difference between Class B and Class A cities and, and other statutory type cities and what they are. And I was watching that over um, cable. Uh, because that's where I was. I, I couldn't get down to the meeting yet to give my presentation uh, for visitors' presentations or sit in. So I was watching it, and I'm going, he's making this a lot harder than it has to be. And um, all he has to do is say, you got to know what a Class B city is first and its parameters before you really get into the details of other things. So... Uh, class A and other statutory type cities and charter cities, whatever, you got to know what you are first and know what you are well. And of course, which I think that's why uh, the council member Coleman, Melinda Coleman, had the, this person come in because she needed to have her boundaries defined for the city council. She knew her boundaries, what her boundaries were. She knew what the city council's boundaries were. I don't think she knew I don't think the city council knew what their boundaries were, and so they're being reestablished. Because when the city was going after trying to find attorneys, the Class B city, it's the city manager that makes all the contracts and approves of contracts, makes the deals, but it's the city council then that has to verify them, that has to approve them and, and finalize the deal. And what was happening for electing or uh, getting our city attorneys, the opposite process was happening. They were holding public meetings and the city council was giving way in on who's going to be the city attorneys. And they're involving a lot of people into this decision who's going to be the city attorney. And that's not how it works. The city 
manager is like a president. They make decisions, and then there's the advice and then the consent of the council. So the president comes up with an appointee, the city manager comes up with an appointee, and then it's up to the council to decide on that, whether they approve or not. If they don't approve, they go back to the drawing board. We see this at the federal level all the time, but a lot of wasted money. Okay, so that's my discussion on Class B. We're going to see that uh, on this tape, and then we're going to get into domestic violence. So let's uh, watch this uh, video here. You can state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Yeah, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Tim Kinley, my address is on the record there. Uh, Thank you for providing these workshops and on TV. I was watching. Uh, really uh, appreciate that. Can't always people can't always get to where they want to be or need to be at a particular point in time. Uh, so it's good to be able to review that. Um, I know it was said that it was a really good workshop. Um, I have read through the Class B city laws, and I just personally felt that if you would have gone through that, it would have been uh, a lot better. Uh, and wouldn't have been as confusing for the uh, constituents hearing about other classes of cities, not really totally understanding does that one really apply to Class B or is that something else? Uh, to me, it got, it would seem to be rather confusing. Um, but if they just went through a Class B city only on what Class B cities can and can't do in their structure, and for example, with uh, uh, you know, Class B city, I think it's pretty clear that if you, it's the uh, city manager that appoints the city attorneys and then get approved by uh, the city council, not the other way around. Uh, and I just think we went through a wrong process there. And if we did, I guess I just would be careful because that just opens us to more problems. Uh, legal problems or whatever down the road. I'm not saying that I disagree with who was appointment. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just talking about the process. Okay, uh, I want to bring up domestic violence again. Uh, there was a, a murder at a restaurant on Rice Street uh, a while back, not too long ago. And according to the newspaper, um, the, the reason the fight started was because a woman attacked another woman that ended up in the death of a man. And so I'm just curious, I, and I, I can't find out, it's really hard to find out, but were, were any women charged in this, um, you know, as far as uh, initiating it or uh, disorderly conduct or something that, you know, starting a riot? Uh, I would like to know, and I and, it, and, then, and I will ask the police chief privately, uh, but that's important to know if we're going to deal with domestic violence. Let's deal with it fairly. Let's deal with it correctly. And I mention that because a friend of mine or an acquaintance through SCC, Ray Whitstrand, was not in Maplewood, but was uh, near his home, and two women got in a fight. And uh, one was... Uh, got beat up, pushed down, and he came in to help mediate. And then another guy, an, another, a man went and hit him over the head. Uh, and severe damage. He's not recovered. He's doing better. But, but there was no place in this that I saw that the press covered that these women were prosecuted for disorderly conduct, engaging in a right, something uh, in that matter that okay, caused such harm. Reached your time limit, so okay. thank you. All right, thank um, you very much. I don't know, Chief Snell, can you, do you, can you even respond or I don't know? It is an active and ongoing criminal investigation and we're not able to speak to it at this point in time. Um, you know, we're getting closer on that one. We just uh, received some preliminary information from the medical examiner and the case is being submitted to the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. Uh, but I think it's in fundamentally important to be crystal clear that um, ultimately the death was caused by one man beating another man uh, to the point of causing his death. 
And I think that that point has to be made crystal clear. Is that the Tiki Hut one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mark Bradley is the last. Okay. All right. I want to make some clarifications here. Um, for, first of all, uh, on the Class B city issue, um, I just want to say that SEC, your local cable channels, uh, it's a big deal that SEC, Ramsey, Washington County Cable com uh, Communications, is able to present and record these events. Uh, the city council meetings, the um, Human Rights Commission, any commissions with inside the city, because then you have access to see what's going on inside your city, what's ha what your city's trying to do. And which in my mind is way too much of social engineering and not enough of protecting your liberties um, and being focused on the things they're supposed to do, like roads, police, fire, and instead they're working with uh, uh, human, uh, with the, um, Maplewood Community Center, essentially sta establishing their own churches uh, is what's happening. And you're paying for it, and you can't participate in it. That's a real huge problem going on there. But SCC and other local cable providers are providing this, and if it goes away, you got nothing. You know, the press doesn't cover very well these local areas. And here you get to engage and you get to see what's going on, not only at the government level, but you also can get citizens input through shows like mine or other shows of people who just want to get on and there's no money tied into this from our perspective. We're not making money here. I'm not making any. Uh, this costs me and it, it, um, you get it as it is. Otherwise, it's not here. Uh, you do pay for it if you subscribe to Comcast, and I think that's a good benefit uh, for you. And so there is that battle going on, and this studio itself is one of the best studios around produce, producing good content, and good information is coming out from here uh, by citizens in the area. So um, continue to support this. Um, now... On the domestic violence case, uh, it is important to understand, and I agree with Officer Schnell, yes, the bottom line is this, that a man was beaten at the Tiki Hut, went home, and don't, didn't go to a hospital and ended up dying at home. My understanding uh, from those wounds, but they have to know for sure, well, is it from that or from something else? You know, were, were, were those wounds not hard enough, but then did he go home and shoot himself? You know, I mean, then the, then the guy didn't kill him. It would have been something else, just the beating him up. So what do you charge him with? And you have to wait for the autopsy for that. But the point I was trying to make, which was avoided, and I, I talked to Officer Schnell afterwards, and he, I think he gave the standard answer, which is mostly... Uh, citizens don't know what they're talking about. They're not engaged in the law. They haven't dealt with these issues. So I'm just going to throw something out there and, you know, maybe he'll go away. You know, but I know better. It, here was the conversation, as I recall it, and I said, uh, these women had something. There should be some charges against them because if the paper is right, they started the fight. They started the fighting. One woman attacked an 18-year-old daughter of a man. Okay, well, that man's going to defend his daughter. And then it was the other man uh, that was with the woman that attacked the daughter that came in and then pounded on the father. And that's according to the paper. Could be all wrong with that, you know. So there's a lot to know here until they get charged out. But either way, if this woman attacked this daughter, who's 18 and is an adult, is she going to be charged with anything? That's my question. She needs to be. And the answer I got from Officer Schnell was, basically, it's not worth it. You know, And I'm going, 
wait, there has to be some consequences for people who start fights. And the feeling I got was, it's a woman, we're not going to deal with it. It's like women have some special privilege that they can beat up whoever they want, they can fight whoever they want, and who cares? Okay? And I was in Dakota County Wednesday listening to some people, you know, ending up doing their plea deals, getting their sentencing. There was one woman there who did hit a man, <laughs> and she got convicted of it, and this was her sentencing. You know, it was a light sentencing, but she paid the price. She admitted to it. She admitted she was wrong. She didn't think it mattered that, I mean, it was kind of like, well, I, I didn't hurt him. It just doesn't matter. And then there was another guy there who uh, was having his sentence at, for basically starting a fight, but all he did in that fight was, in anger, tip the table over. And then the people around him started fighting, and people got hurt, uh, from my understanding, what they were saying there. And he got prosecuted. And, and I could not pick up what statute he was being prosecuted under, but I know the statute exists, intending to cause fear of bodily harm or causing bodily harm or death. Fear of bodily harm or death. Causing fear. That means all you have to do is create fear in another person, and that's a misdemeanor. So when this woman attacks this daughter, 18-year-old daughter, who's still an adult and still a woman. That's the charge you go after him for. Okay? And I don't see that the attitude, because you've got to level the playing field here. If you're going to hold people responsible, hold them responsible. Because that one woman acted out against another woman, a man is dead. If they wouldn't have acted out maybe it wouldn't have happened. Then you put one man in the position of trying to protect his daughter. It doesn't mean he's hitting the other woman. Could have, but we don't know that. But if he even tries to protect her, that brings the other guy into the picture. And what happens to the woman? They walk away. Now, in the situation with Ray Woodstrand, I haven't seen anything in the press that said uh, these women that started the, basically the riot when Ray got beat up, got prosecuted for intending to cause bodily harm or fear of bodily harm, and they should be charged out against both of them. And they should look and say who find, found out what. But for them to have nothing, and I mean, there's a big piece of the puzzle. That fight didn't start, would Ray Woodstrand very likely not have his damages? Would those people have been someplace else? Would they still have been in the house and Ray would have been able to walk home in peace? You know, we don't know that, but what we do know is what did happen to a large extent. And everybody's testimony was the women started the fight. But it seems to me that uh, our... And it ends up being sexism by uh, our county attorneys by our police officers, uh, that they don't, uh, if they don't charge these out just because they're women, yet there's severe consequences. And then it happens to a man who just flipped the table over, and he gets it. I see it happen in all the courts are charged out like this, but for Chief Snell to be so defensive that that's not a potential solution, he just could have acted differently and said, you know what, yes, it does happen. That is the reality, and they could be charged. You know, we're still investigating. Okay, well, I, I want to see somebody charged if they got in a fight. So uh, that's, that, that's my domestic violence talk. And uh, next time we're at city council meeting, we'll see if uh, the uh, domestic violence, uh, see what else I have to say about domestic violence. Okay. Um, the next thing we're going, oh, the other thing I want to say, again, people, if you have comments or questions, feel free to call in. It's a live show, 651-747-3838. See past shows on youtube.com, 
backslash speechless mn or you can go to the uh, website there with questions or comments you may have once in a while I do look at that or my email address um, there's a town hall meeting we got a lot of video but we're just gonna play a couple of them here because I want to get into these court cases but question I have Senator Wigger and Representative Peter Fisher um, was about our judiciary where do you stand on elections versus appointment and what we're going to uh, we're, we're going to hear their answer and then I'll do some more explaining so let's watch that clip yeah the, uh, uh, the issue I want to talk about is the judiciary and the legislature by our Constitution is supposed to hold the judicial accountable and discipline them uh, when they misbehave uh, we have a judge in Scott County who for three years, never signed her oath of office or gave an oath of, oath, oath of office that was taken through the courts and the courts ignored it. <coughs> By our U.S. Constitution, it says state judges have to swear an oath of office. By our statutes, they have to swear and sign an oath of office. And it doesn't matter whether they just forgot or not. And they can't do an official act of office <coughs> until they sign or swear an oath three years and this person asked the judge to recuse themselves they refused went to the court Supreme Court and the Supreme Court changed the question and wouldn't address the vacancy that is automatically created by law is, is there a bill ad addressing this to correct that uh, no it's already in law so I, I mean to change uh, you know so that you have to do an oath because, you, no, I mean, it's already in law. You have, you have to, to do, do it. Be a city council member, right? You no, no, we, we go for a judge too. Uh, on our oath and, uh, but this was a plenty appointed judge, three years, never signed an oath. Okay. And uh, but when she was approached, and then she went out and signed her oath, okay. and then the high court. But that office is then vacated. Dayton could appoint a judge now to that spot, and. Um, there's just this lack of accountability. And I know it starts in the House. So I, I sent a letter out in November, a flyer I gave to all the legislators and haven't heard anything back from anybody. Uh, so that's that accountability is an issue. And that gets to my final question as to where, my real question as to where you stand on uh, judges being elected or appointed. Uh, there's a big debate. There's constitutional amendments being uh, uh, <laughs> proposed that would take away our right to vote for judges. Yeah, time's running out, so. unfortunately, uh, elected. And in terms of the issue in Dakota, I mean, I could talk to Judge Knudsen, but it's vacated now, so. I prefer retention elections where going through if the person isn't you know, is voted out, but then taking a look at an independent group, taking a look at qualifications and then going through that route. Because I just see in other states where they've had pure appointments, it becomes very the judges become very political, much more political than they are here, and follow what what is expected in terms of funding. It does not always lead to the best rules. So I'm concerned. So that, that's my concern. Bottom obviously. line question is accountability. How are we going to hold judges accountable and have a system of checks and balances? Not separate. We have separations of power. There's nobody's talking about checks and balances. Okay. So we have how are we going to do two, checks and balances? We can do uh, two more questions, and then I have to be over to Maplewood. But all right, didn't answer the last question. Um, a lot of things going on there. Most of the people that came to this town hall meeting were not happy uh, with what was going on, and we're going to see a little bit of that in a bit. Uh, but Chuck Wigger's question: Is there a bill to change this? And so he wasn't getting what I was saying, should have picked up on this and what I said, and he should know this. It's already law. It's already settled law. It's already, the judges have to take an oath and sign an oath. It's already there in the law. So there's no law to change. There's a law to enforce. And it's kind of the attitude of a lot of organizations when something, you hear it around gun rights, we need more regulation. The issue is, no, enforce the regulations you have, okay, then these problems should go away. Now, the question is, is it in the Minnesota Constitution that judges have to sign an oath? I can't find it. It is in the Constitution that the, all the executive branch has to sign an oath. It's in the Constitution 
that uh, executive, the legislature has to sign and swear an oath. Okay, it's in the statute, but it's in the U.S. Constitution that says a judge has to give an oath and sign an oath. But it's in the statute that says all of them have to sign and give an oath, and then it details which is what the statutes are for. They're to delineate the Constitution and deliver a process so that the Constitution is um, enforced. And so the statutes inf help enforce the Constitution. So if we tell our judges or legislatures, you've got to sign an oath, here's the process. But statutes can also tell judges to sign an oath and also fulfill the U.S. Constitution. And we have that. And, and, and it lays out who has to sign an oath, when they have to do it, and what the consequences are. And the consequences are for anybody who doesn't do an official action, who, who does an official action, who hasn't signed an oath, has vacated their office by doing the official action. And see, this is, he, he's pretending he didn't get it, but I think he understood it. And uh, he went on to say, "What uh, I could talk to Judge Knutson. Judge Knutson in Dakota, Dakota County, the, the judge that arrested uh, Michelle McDonald in the courtroom, took her files from her, an attorney practicing before him, and made her client not have representation in a hearing instead of tabling the, not tabling, but postponing the hearing for another day when the, his, whatever his grievance over Michelle McDonald was dealt with? No, Judge Knutson's a crook. And so here's Judge Knutson, in my mind, and here's Judge Knutson, who is a former state senator, and he, and a Republican, and Wigger wants to talk to him. You know, that tells me a little bit about some of these connections going on here that aren't on the up and up. And if Wigger's hanging out with Judge Knutson, uh, that's big problems in my book. Okay. Now, Chuck, um, I'm sorry, Peter Fisher. Now, the discussion came in under the Constitution. Are you for judges being elected or appointed? And, of course, Senator Wigger said elected, but what does elected mean? Because they're calling this new Constitution retention elections. So if nobody's running against a judge and it's only that judge's name, then you're voting to retain them, and they're calling that an election. Well, that's not an election. Election is contested, okay? And if nobody runs, it's not an election. And so we don't know really where he stands on that. He was able to wiggle out of that one. He's smart enough to know it because it was just election, um, it wasn't retention election or contested election. All right, we got a phone call. So phone call, do you have a comment or question? All right, we can't hear you yet. We're working it out. So caller, are you there? Comment or question? Yes, Tim, this is Rich Newmeister. Hey, Rich, how you doing? I'm doing all right. I just want to make a comment. I agree with you on one, and I disagree with you on the other. All right. And, of course, you're... Sp your program speechless, and you respect free speech is what it's all about. You bet. Anyways, with Judge Dave Knutson, I disagree with you on his description of him. Uh, I've worked with him on many, many pieces of legislation when uh -huh. he was a senator, and he's a good person. I just saw him the other day, and I just want you know that's my point of view. Yeah. And I just wanted to share that he's been very helpful. A lot of legislation is helping a lot of Minnesotans on privacy and all that that I've worked with them on. The mm -hmm. second aspect is that I saw Judge Gildy, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Gildy, and I thanked her for allowing you to, uh, you know, not be a stickler for rules and take a look at the reality sometimes and to allow you to film uh, your, for part of your oh, program. Oh, I even good. told her I saw you, I saw the thing on your program. So okay. anyways. So thank you. <laughs> uh, it's one out <laughs> of two, but, you know, we, this is a democratic society. We, as you know, you and I, we disagree on some things, and on some things we agree on Sure, others. E exactly. And, and there's a process to work that out, and, and you engage that process very, very well. Uh, so, yeah, we do have a different, and, and this is part of the deal, and a very, you know, 
you can agree with a person on some things. Yeah, you know, and, and you can I, get along with them well. And then on other things, you see this at the legislature, you're, you're violently opposed. <laughs> you know? yeah, and, I just want to let you know there are some issues coming down the pike okay. that some of your viewers might be, uh, have an interest in. Sure. <clears throat> One is uh, House File 430 was just introduced today. This is the body camera bill for police. Okay. Basically, it's the uh, Tony Cornish is the chief author in the House, uh -huh. and it's basically a police uh, union bill. Sure. It's coming from that perspective. Okay. Uh, there's another bill on both now, sides. Now, where, where do you stand on House that bill, Rich? Dealing with body cameras. Rich, where do you stand on that House File 430? Uh, for me personally, uh, there needs to be, I'd like to see as much as what is now uh, available to the public in written form on police activities to also be with the video. Uh -huh. But the bottom line, there are three important things that at least I'm lobbying on about, in, you know, that are big, big things. One is that if you, if a law enforcement officer comes into my home, home in a non-emergency, but for a call for service or whatever, right? and I know they have a camera on, and they want to come into my home, I have a right to say, no, you need my permission, my consent to come into my home in regards with a camera and a video okay. and audio recorder. The second point... Well, wouldn't they, wouldn't they still need permission to go into the home anyway? In that, yeah, but, yeah. but then with, you're adding the issue of if they have the camera, you can have them in your home, but you can tell them to turn the camera off. That, that's my contention. Yes, I and, agree and, with and that. And some folks will say no, like Chief Ramsey of Duluth, from what I've heard and what he testifies, is basically he would like to have the cameras on all the time. If you say you want it off before you come to my home or whatever, uh, you know, non-emergency. Right, non-emergency, uh, yeah. You know, he's going to have the camera on. That makes sense to me. What? What you just said. Oh, okay. The, your, your position on this. Okay, the, 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 the second point is, is that, as you know, many law enforcement officers commit with people all the time. Sure. You, you do it. I have done that. And <clears throat> they, I think it's important for us, the public, to have notice a little flashing light, or if you ask them, or whatever, is your video camera on, which also will record audio and video. Right. So notification is important. Absolutely. And the third important thing, no matter what, it will all it should always be public. When there's excessive use of force, when there is a shooting or killing by a law enforcement officer, you know, to another person, and third, that when there's any kind of issues of mental health, those videos should always, always be public, you know, after the investigation or, you know, whatever the process is, because that's pretty much one of the main reasons why the videos are there. <clears throat> but the bill, basically, as introduced from a union, police union point of view, does not allow for any videos to be public. <laughs> wow. Which is, which yeah. It's turning upside down. Absolutely. So those are, and as you know, there's other little things like the current law where it says child abuse information, you know, or victims of a sexual assault. All those would still remain private. You know, you would, you would probably get blurried faces or you well, probably wouldn't get stuff out. I mean, that's the kinds of things with that. And that's why so many of your viewers... And folks need to be pay attention to something like that at the legislature. You're an uh, video person, Tim, so you right. know what I'm talking about, yep. how you can look at accountability through video. Right. And the, another one is license plate readers. Oh, what, did you have a bill number for this? Oh, for uh, the body camera bill, it's House File 430. Okay. And, the, and then you had another bill number in there. Well, I didn't say any other bill number, but I was okay. talking about a bill. All right. Dealing with license plate readers. Okay. This has been the third s session dealing with license plate readers. And there are two set of uh, bills. One is by Ron Latz, 
uh, how, Senate File 86, which basically keeps uh, and retains uh, license plate scans on innocent and law-abiding people for 90 days. And then there's Senate File 31 that was part of a recommendation uh, being done by Senator Brandon Peterson and Scott Dibble, a bipartisan bill. Uh, and also there, for the other bill I was telling you about, Latches Bill, there's bipartisan support There's in, in some areas. I mean, uh, <clears throat> maybe not who, who knows yet. It's still in the committee process. But the other bill where there's no retention of scans on innocent people with pictures and uh-huh. where your location is and all that, uh, that bill is zero. They don't re- law enforcement does not retain that data. On the other side of the, in the House, I don't know the House numbers, but uh, the one that retains no data on innocent people keeping right. uh, license plate scans, again, it's bipartisan, done by John Lesh and Peggy Scott. Sure. And then uh, Tony Cornish, uh, who's a Republican. Mm-hmm. Again, it's, not non, it's bipartisan on a lot of these things. He's keep, he wants to keep data for 90 days. In other words, his bill, Cornish's bill, is the companion one for Lats, and the companion for Brandon Peterson's is done by Scott and Lesh. But, but things are starting to heat up. Yeah. Things are starting to come. There's going to be a committee hearing on next Tuesday that says you have a constitutional right to privacy in your electronic records. In other words... Sweet. They're, they're updating huh. uh, the Fourth Amendment part of our state constitution that says you have privacy rights in all your personal papers and effects, which are now in electronic form. Right. <laughs> and the courts have been slow to recognize the Fourth Amendment uh, expectation of privacy in those areas. So A lot it, of states are starting to do that. Yeah. Missouri, Wyoming, California, Montana have added privacy to their state constitutions. So there was a, a wiggle room for uh, our government to get away with doing things they know they shouldn't have done because it wasn't explicit, explicit. <laughs> well, I, I have run, uh, I don't know, I'm sure you have too. You've run against the, uh, again, with the argument by people saying, well, that's constitutional, uh, based, maybe based on a 40-year-old court decision right. and not facing the reality. Right. As you may know, a lot of times law is does not catch up with the technology, and that was an issue last year when you or others you may know or others may know that there was a big deal dealing with new technology that the, uh, Rich Stanick had, uh-huh. a sheriff in BCA called the Stingray, where mm-hmm. it will uh, nobody knew about it, where it locates. Uh, you a target, at, at, uh, your cell phone location, and then also drags up other information. Oh. The legislature found out about it. I did a data request about it, and then we there was a passed a law that said you, you need a probable cause warrant to do it, rather than for almost thirty years they were operating the new technology under the standard if it's uh, relevant to an investigation. Right. Two big differences. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, anyways, I just wanted to give you my two cents. Hey, I appreciate it. It's always very informative. Okay. So thanks for calling. All right, bye. Well, and he he raises some issue that actually comes up with one of the court cases that we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to do a little bit of a change here. I was going to show another clip of uh, the town hall meeting, but I'll just tell you about it. Basically, the question is asked, are you... We're, we've just recovered from, we're starting to recover from this recession. Gas prices have come down. People are trying to dig out of the hole, and now you want to raise the gas tax. Are you going to vote for a raise or not? Senator Wigger said, yes, I am. I'm going to vote for a raise because our roads are in such a problem. Well, they're not that bad, and we always spend money on our roads. He just wants it automatic where we don't think about it, which is going to be inflationary and stuff like that. All right, we got another caller here with question or comments, and then we'll get into these court cases. Caller, go ahead. Tim Kinley. Hey. I just wanted to weigh in on the last caller issue. 
yes. on uh, body cam and police brutality, excessive force. Uh huh. And you know, it's good that gentleman brings up some uh, you know fascinating items on how they all what's going on down at the Capitol because it's extremely hard to follow what's going on at the Capitol. Uh, and in terms of the freedom of information in the state of Minnesota or the yeah. sunshine law, right. what I've noticed, they're very poor. I mean, we know the state legislature does a lot of their real uh, talking and real decision-making back in private, just like Nora Salwick, who came from the legislature, wants the Maplewood Council to do it. Uh, has found some sort of loophole, so she has a subcommittee, so she thinks she can do the city business. They, right. Uh, in private, just like they do at the state capitol, right. which is all very poor. And Minnesota is, does a very terrible job opening the government up through their laws, and there needs to be it, major it, It's reform. tremendously difficult. You're, you're absolutely right. And the court system is even worse than the government. E uh, even though the law is they, very clear, they're going to make it as hard as they can. And you yes. see this at all levels. And, and even for the executive branch, for the legislative branch to get information from the executive. The executive branch fights it. It's unbelievable. It's just, yeah. And it, what's most troubling and disturbing is whether it's the executive branch, whether it's a court system, whether the legislative system, whether it's your local Maplewood City Council, the leaders like Nora Salwick keeps talking about how transparency is so important, it is the top priority, and it's a priority uh, that they follow. And as you know, all that is false and phony, and it's disingenuous, and it leaves the citizenry who knows what's going on to, uh, to have a lot of disrespect for how government is conducting its business as wow. if they're conducting yeah. it as a private club. Right. Exactly. And the, yeah. Yep. And the issue about freedom of information in terms of the uh, body cams, or now they have dash cams in Maplewood. There was a killing of a 60-year-old uh, gentleman out, uh, out when he was outside of the Health Aids Hospital in Maplewood. That's months ago. That happened in November, approximately November 1st. And they're still saying they're investigating it. They're working for toxicology. And that's Paul Schnell. Paul Schnell, the Maplewood police, uh, who is like the bag man for Nora Salwick to pamper her. And his buddy, Mark Weigel, Mark Weigel, uh, who is the, with the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department, okay. so they're down at the hearing there, sitting right next right. to each other. That right. was the campaign manager of yes. North Salwick. All these guys are buds. They're opposing transparency. Absolutely. In New Jersey, in New Jersey, they're, they're, yeah. uh, the police uh, you know, shot a guy in his car. They told him to get out of his car, and they shot him. Or the, He was in his car, and he was getting out. And they shot the guy dead. Yeah. You realize that film was out within a couple of days. Right. It's been November first, and yeah. uh, Maplewood government and Paul Schnell and his buddy Mark Weigel, because Ramsey County was involved. Okay, we got to wrap it up here, caller. I got to get going. Yeah. So thank you. But yeah. I want to I want to address a couple of your points. It's you know when you go in and politely ask and try to get some information, and they give you your, their attitude. And that happened to me today. I was in, in the courtroom in Scott County, and the deputy all of a sudden stands up, all right, everybody out of the courtroom, and, and actually said something before that. And, and, I, it, and he goes, it's a closed hearing. And I go, well, you know, first of all, I'm racing through my Why is there a closed hearing? It's public courtrooms. But he said something before that, and I said, uh, you know, sir, um, what did you say before we had to get out of the courtroom? I said, get out of the courtroom. I said, no, what, what did you have to say before that? It doesn't matter. Get out of the courtroom. I just ask him nicely. And I'm walking out at the same time. You know, I'm not going to stop. And, and, and then I asked him, well, aren't all courtrooms open to the public? This is our courtroom. Why, you know, why is it being closed off? Just get out of here, you know. He could have just answered nicely and said the reason. You know, he knew the reason. He had said the reason. I didn't hear it the first time, so I asked him to repeat it. And um, I have his name. i got to get his badge number yet uh, as to what, what it was. But we left the courtroom, and they had their private 
uh, hearing there, which may mean it was juvenile. Who knows? You know, got to find that out. Didn't need to be that way. And then, of course, a man in New Hope was shot dead because he was shooting people, trying to kill police officers in the New Hope City Council. But finding out later, he, his opinion, he was treated really bad by New Hope. And there's more to this story here. I mean, when a man, you take a man's property from him for little teeny things, and whatever it is, we've got to get to the bottom of this. The press hasn't even begun to get to the bottom of this. They're trying. You can push a person over the edge. So try to be kind in this process. You know, if someone politely asks you for information and you're a government employee, help direct them to where they can find it. It's your job. You're a servant. You know, and that's not happening. But as far as privacy in the courtroom or getting public data in the courtroom, let's say you're a, you're a client, and this was the, about the meeting Wednesday. Don, Don Mashek, the hearing Wednesday in, in Dakota County, Don Mashek had been charged with disorderly conduct. And that was for passing a note to somebody, a defendant, during who was a friend of theirs, an acquaintance, during a recess, okay? And th so that's the charge. Perfectly fine to do, okay? No problem. There's no chains going on here. Nobody, uh, actually it was a civil case. I'm sorry about that, a uh, civil case. So, you know, casual, people talk all the time. I was in the criminal case today where the, well, during recess, the, the uh, accused was talking to uh, family members and saying hi and talking to friends or whatever, and perfectly all right, no problem with that. Um, but then later, during the courtroom, the, the deputy during the hearing taps Don Mashek on the shoulder and says, come with me. So Don followed him out. He's part of the press, follows him out, and start walking clear down the other end of the courtroom, courthouse, and Don stops and goes, um, what's your name and badge number? And asked him five times, and I guess I wasn't there, according to him, raised his voice a little each time, but it was never yelling, what's your name and badge number? Officers are supposed to give that to you right away. Okay, wasn't happening. The fifth time the officer was asked, he arrest him for disorderly conduct for raising his voice, which doesn't even meet the statute, mind you. So there was something going on because Don's an outspoken person against the courts and the corruption that's going on. And, but to hear a public defender tell you that they're not going to defend you, they're not going to put your exhibits in, we're not going to deal with the issue that uh, the county has over and over been asked for the videos in the courtroom and in the hallway, and guess what? Dakota County films it all the time, okay? There, there are these videos. They acknowledge there were these videos, and then they destroyed them, okay? And they knew there were charges because Don said the charges were already against him, and he told him right away, preserve the videos, because he knew there was cameras in the courtroom. Why do we know there's cameras in this courtroom? It's because of what they did to Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald, because they had videos of her in Judge Knutson's courtroom, where Judge Knutson went and, and issued an oral warrant, which is unconstitutional and illegal uh, to do. And then there's part of my distinction with uh, uh, Rich Neumeister. You know, once he got in the position of power, man, the, the black robe, the black disease uh, hit him. And this is not the only person uh, that has complaints against Judge David Knutson. Uh, he's turned into a king and has thiefed him and said, saying the rules don't apply to him. He's in trouble. And he may have been a nice guy in the legislature, but he's turned into, from what I've seen and heard, a tyrant in Dakota County. Uh, so things happen, you know. But how many people do you have to murder to be a murderer? How many times do you have to violate the law to be a lawbreaker? You know, I mean, in, in one sense, are we all there? Yeah. Uh, do you as a citizen get held accountable for the teeniest thing? So Don's been back in court 
time and time and time again trying to deal with this issue, trying to get the charges dropped because they know they're false. And the judge ordered the prosecutor to preserve the evidence, but they got rid of it. And um, boy, a whole lot else was going on. But I can't get into all the details of the court case, but we're losing time. But here's this issue is they want to have evidence against us, but in their process of collecting evidence against us, they're going to destroy the evidence that's against them. And they will try to do that, and they pushed it on this issue, and, and they knew better, and it's just obvious. But in this case, Don Mashek was just browbeating these guys, and he figured out a way to be able to make his presentation before things got going. And it's a long story. I don't have time for it, but there's two things the judge said that were just a lie. I thought the judge, though, was very patient, very fair, letting things go through the process. Okay, and, and I, his demeanor was fantastic, in my opinion. But, you know, you can have great demeanor and smile when you're stabbing somebody. You know, oh, I'm all for your rights. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, you have the right to life. Uh, uh. Are we out of time? He said two things. Uh, you have the right to who represent you whoever you want to. That's a bunch of baloney, and you have the right to get rid of an attorney if you don't want him. That's a bunch of baloney. Of course, the two can't meet. Okay? Yeah. And so it's just, it was unbelievable. All right, we're done. Uh, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire